in undergrad as a in chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, I studied theology. I was ordained as a diocesan priest. I functioned in seven or uh, in three different uh, parishes. I also became a student of urban training and community organization in Toronto and Chicago. I was the assistant director of the Toronto School of Theology, with where I taught for the last 30 years. I've been a faculty member and the director of the graduate program in culture and spirituality at Holy Names University. In 2000, in, uh, which I recently retired, I um, received the Thomas Berry Award in 2013. and the author of 11 books, the most recent to be published in January, called mm-hmm. Becoming a Planetary People, Celebrations of Earth, Art, and Spirit. So would you, uh, could you um, elaborate a little little bit more about what culture and spirituality is? That really caught my attention. You know, one of the the, uh, developing themes in the last number of years has been liberation theology, Mm -hmm. which was founded by authors and theologians in Latin America initially, Mm -hmm. but has really spread around the world to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, the Black Liberation Movement in the United States, Mm -hmm. and the uh, program which unites culture and spirituality the foundation of this, the meaning of this and the reason for it is that every spirituality and every theology is grounded in a context. Mm -hmm. When we don't have a context, we become fundamentalists. In other words, we practice uh, our tenets without an awareness of the, the environment or the context in which we are living. Mm -hmm. So, the whole notion of a, the way I often describe it is if you have a pail of water, mm-hmm. the spirituality is the water, but the pail is the culture. It contain, it creates the context in which the spirituality is practiced. You can see it from an ecological perspective in creation spirituality, from a woman's perspective, from the point of view of feminist theology, the experience of uh, African-American people in America called black theology. All of these are cultural contexts in which people are able to implement and uh, practice their their vision and their faith and their uh, spirituality within the situation in which they find themselves. Uh, what is it about, you know, the way you grew up or different revelations that you had uh, during that made you love the environment or the earth? Well, you know, I grew up in a village in southwestern Ontario uh, in Canada Mm -hmm. that bordered the uh, the rivers separated the United States from Canada. Mm -hmm. When I was, my father, we had a we had three quarters of an acre in our little village. Mm-hmm. We had a garden. We had chickens. We had a cow. Uh, in the summertime, uh, we would swim in the river. And in those days, in the winter, we would skate on the river. Oh, wow. I know one time when I was had been away from my home area for some time. I was driving back to visit that river, the St. Clair, Mm -hmm. which unites Lake Huron to Lake St. Clair. 
and literally my mouth began to water. I felt like I was, I had a cellular relationship with the natural world, especially with that river that was like, it was refreshing in the summer. It was a place where pe- young people would fish and swim and skate. And it was sort of my, what Thomas Berry often used the term, my bioregion, that mm-hmm. part of the earth where I felt at home and where my spirituality and my life was actually shaped and formed by the water, by the trees, by the breeze in the evening, by the sun shining down on the on the river. And as a student, I would often go to the, with the farmers and help them uh, prepare, bring in the harvest. Well, I remember the big maple tree in the backyard. I remember the uh, my father coming home from work every night and after dinner going out to the garden to hold the beets and the corn and the and the, the tomatoes and the muskmelons and the things, all of the things that he had planted. And it was his way of continuing that connection because as a young man, he grew up on a farm and in a sense, he brought the farm to our little town. I'm pretty sure, you know, we're both not in those kind of very nature um, oriented areas, right? So That's a lot right. Of- yeah, so a lot of the youth of our time, um, they they really don't have that connection. And um, so this kind of leads to our second question, which is, for example, I myself, I grew up in a very uh, urban area, but, you know, recently I've been more into the environment and trying to be more connected to it. What is um, the advice that you could give to people like us? I was writing and studying the recent encyclical by Pope Francis, Mm -hmm. Laudate Si on care for our common home. As a Roman Catholic and an ordained one at that, uh, I have grown up with a strong tradition of dedication to the poor, the, uh, the excluded, the homeless, the hungry, Mm -hmm. and that was part of my tradition. And if you look around and see what particularly women religious in the Catholic tradition have followed, but also generally uh, almost everyone to some extent, the emphasis was placed on the care of the, for the human poor. Mm -hmm. But then, in the publication of, on June 19, 18th of this year, Pope Francis invoked the primary focus of his encyclical as the word under the rubric of what he calls integral ecology. In fact, when you called this morning, I was reading about what Thomas Berry and uh, the cultural historian and mm-hmm. student of Teilhard de Chardin and Leonardo Boff, the um, liberation theologian from Brazil, who wrote a book called The Cry of the Poor and the Cry of the Earth. It's a wonderful book. Yeah. In fact, it's a, it's this, if you read Thomas Berry's Dream of the Earth and Leonardo Boff's Cry of the Poor, Cry of the Earth, you get the essence of what is being explored and described by Pope Francis in in his encyclical. Mm-hmm. Because he, in fact, even even though he doesn't refer to Bath specifically, he uses those very words in the encyclical, the cry mm-hmm. of the poor and the cry of the earth. So what is exciting in my for me these days is the dynamic integration mm-hmm. that has brought together under one rubric, or if you will, under one vision, the integration of the ecology and humanity. 
-hmm. Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, who were Catholic married couple at Yale University, this is what they wrote. While discussion about social justice has been robust in Catholic Christian context, this encyclical marks the first time social and environmental concerns are brought together. Yeah. Years ago, in 1990, I wrote a book called Geo Justice, A Preferential Option for the Earth. Mm -hmm. And in that book, I was trying to bring together in my way the, the human and other than human concerns that we should have for the planet and its people. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been just thrilled and excited, both personally, but also in terms of what's needed for the earth right now mm -hmm. and for the planet, is that this is a seamless garment. You know, years ago, the Bishop of Chicago, Cardinal Joseph E. Bernadine, was trying to show that there was a, a broad spectrum of common interest between those who were concerned about the right to life and also about the life of those who were here on this planet at that time. He called it a seamless garment. It was like one story. It was one vision. And that integral ecology, the words of Pius or Francis, the Pope Francis, is, in a sense, a seamless garment. Integral ecology encompasses our care for the human and for the other than human, for the natural world, which, in a sense, according to the writings of Thomas Berry, is the primary way in which we encounter God. The, he calls it the, the um, primary revelation. In other words, even Thomas Aquinas, many years ago, wrote a, in his Summa Theologica that we have two scriptures to read. We have the scriptures of the sacred text. We have the scriptures of the natural world. And it's one story. It's one tradition. And today, we are encouraged by the Pope and many others to in, engage the natural world as the sacred revelatory encounter with God, but also as the foundation and the care for which can make the human situation more lively. Because if we have polluted water, if we have toxic land, if we have acid rain, in the in the air, then we're, we we are violating Thomas Berry, who said you can't have healthy people on a sick planet. So we need to unite these two dynamic connections to make the world better, to protect the planet for the children who will follow, and to have healthy people to move forward into the future. Yeah. So your advice would be to integrate these two? Um... I would say to meditate on the new encyclical. See, the, the church over the years, and Thomas Barrett was one of the prophetic voices of this, the church was never that concerned or at least never referred into its, in its major uh, voice mm -hmm. uh, that we should con be concerned about the earth. Thomas Berry was a prophetic voice who called us to that. Mm -hmm. And now, five years after his death, his lifetime of work is being affirmed in the main channels or the main halls of, of, uh, of the Catholic tradition of which he was a, a member of the religious community of the congregation of the, he was a passionist. And yeah. um, he spent his life trying to figure out. He said, I had to go someplace to think. I went to a monastery. 
and see and his his wisdom and his thinking now integrated with the vision of Leonardo Boff has brought us to a new point in human earth history and a new place in the practice of our Christian Catholic tradition. And the world, but see, Pope Francis didn't write this for Catholics. He wrote it for the world. And so we often talk about, I often refer to Mike, to Meister Eckhart, the great medieval mystic who himself was a Dominican preacher. He said, you know, you can have many wells, but one river. You can have a Buddhist well, an Islamic well, a Protestant well, a Catholic well, um, a pagan well. Mm -hmm. But if you drill down you come to that great common underground river, which is his image of who God, who God is. So we have many wells in one river called to implement the vision of integral ecology. Is there a certain part of the environment or the earth that you are um, passionate about? Well, you know, uh, that's, a great, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have it total answer but this is my answer this is my first response is it's all about water hmm. because water poisoned water tonight children around the world will die and one of the main reasons of their physical uh, disease mm -hmm. is poisoned water you know, here in California, we have called, this is the, the drought. It's hard, it hasn't rained here, not nearly enough to quench the land and nourish the crops and uh, cleanse the air. Yeah. So, you know, there's so much to be said about the natural world and what are the main challenges to the to a healthy people on a healthy planet, mm -hmm. I think that one of the major things. I mean, most of our our bodies are mostly water. Yeah. Most of what the uni the universe, uh, the planetary community, you know, is surrounded by oceans. The Great Lakes bioregion, which runs through St. Lawrence River and through all of these rivers and lakes is the primary source of fresh uh, drinkable water here on planet Earth. And yet when I was a child, I was lived, grew up in what Canada calls the Chemical Valley. Oh, and even while I was studying chemistry, I was working for the Imperial Oil Laboratory in, uh, at the mouth of Lake Huron. By the time I was an adult and moved on to college and later uh, to other works, I realized that the water was so polluted, well, of how polluted water and polluted air has caused an imbalance in the human community, but has also caused the shortness of life and the um, devastation mm -hmm. of the uh, the natural world, particularly the health of the food that is grown from the land that itself is poison and toxic. Mm -hmm. So to me, the, you know, Thomas Berry talked about a time when we obey the, the, the commandments of creation, that we have fresh air, we have pure water, we have young children playing in the sun, rejoicing in the in the uh, the fields and the green and the and the beauty around them. He, he often said, you know, if we lived on the moon, if we had the moon as our landscape, then our law, our lives, our souls, our imaginations 
would be truncated and shrunk because we wouldn't have the capacity to live fully the way um, we are called to live because our imaginations and our and our spirits would not be elevated by the beauty of the land and the um, the poetry of of society and so on. 